So appreciate that. So appreciate that. Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning to Luke uh, chapter number 22. Luke chapter number 22. Um, we're going to be looking this morning at the series of, uh, or the, the lesson uh, of Simon Peter, the story of Simon Peter. Uh, Simon Peter is a man who tends to seesaw in his emotions, and so he makes a perfect candidate uh, for our series this morning. One moment he's climbing out of the boat and he's walking on water by faith. And the next moment he sees the winds and waves boisterous and he begins to sink in doubt. Can anyone relate? One moment he is faithfully declaring that even if everybody else falls away, he won't. The next moment he's denying Christ three times. In this passage, we're going to see Peter's failure that leads in turn to guilt and to shame. His shame consumed him, and doubtless he fights a great battle here, the likes of which we don't even see, a great internal battle. We said last week that guilt is usually tied to an event, I I did something bad, but shame lingers on, and shame is tied to a person, and shame says, I am bad. Guilt is the wound, and shame is the scar that it leaves behind. Guilt's isolated to the individual, whereas shame is contagious. We said last week that it's a healthy thing when we feel guilt, because uh, guilt is, is something that reminds us of our need for God. That's an important, important thing. But that emotion of guilt is quickly, nearly uh, simultaneously joined by shame. Guilt says you did something wrong. Shame says that's why you need to hide. You're, you're no good. You need to live in darkness. Come, come with me. I'll, I'll lead the way. Although guilt for the believer is removed by grace through faith, and we took a look at that last week, the shame is the ultimate tool of Satan to render us ineffective. And we'll see that in this passage, that it was Satan's desire to render Peter ineffective. He wanted to sideline him. He wanted to render him useless. So, so here's Peter. Peter is a flawed man on a journey. Today, we're going to see his battle with failure, with shame, but we're also going to see, we're also going to see victory, and we're going to see usefulness, and that ought to be our desire this morning as we battle through this life, uh, to have victory and to be greatly used to be, bring glory uh, to God, and so I want to introduce you this morning uh, to Peter. I want to cover quite a bit of territory in his life before uh, we jump into Luke chapter number 22. I just want to introduce Peter to you as uh, we're introduced to him, and then we're going to take a look at this failure, this collapse, this lack of uh, of faith in his life, and we're going to take a look at how God was not finished with him. His failure wasn't final. Before I jump into our text, I just want to say this. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what failure haunts you. I don't know what mistake in your life Satan consistently brings up to you and says, hey, you, you holier than thou, you trying to look like you got it all together. Remember, and he'll remind you of something that you've tried so desperately to forget. All of us bear scars and all of us have things that we are ashamed of. But I just want to be very clear this morning that shame is a tool that Satan uses. Shame is not of God. And I want you to be very clear with that this morning. Let's pray and we're going to jump into some text. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. I come to you and I am a broken messenger desperately in need of your filling. And so, Father, I pray this morning that here with your folks, that you would fill me with your spirit. I pray that everything I say would be pleasing to you. I pray they'd be helpful and beneficial. I pray, Father, that your word would come alive today, and that it would speak to the hearts of every hearer, myself included. I pray that your spirit would accomplish in every believer that which it, uh, you've set it out to do. And for the one maybe here that doesn't know you as Savior, 
Father, I pray that they'd understand today that the only way to live a life free of guilt, free of shame, is through the salvation that is offered by Jesus Christ. And so I pray that they'd come to faith in Christ today if they've not. I pray that you'd be with those that are teaching in our junior church this morning. I pray that you give them clarity of speech and thought. I pray that your spirit would work through imperfect messengers. And Father, I pray that you would accomplish much in this place today. We thank you for the chance to worship. We thank you for the chance to be used of you. We thank you that in spite of our brokenness, Father, that you clean. And uh, Father, we pray now that you do a work in our hearts today of lasting effect. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are introduced to Peter through several of the various Gospels. The one I've chosen this morning just by way of introduction is Matthew chapter number 4. And Jesus has just begun his earthly ministry. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. We're going to jump into Luke 22 here. But Matthew 4, Jesus has just begun his earthly ministry. And Jesus, the Bible says in verse number 18 of chapter 4, walking uh, by the Sea of Galilee, he saw uh, two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, those next two words, let's say them aloud together, follow me. Uh, Let's say them again if we could. Follow me. Now, I want you to remember those two words uh, because we're going to address those later on in the sermon. It's very imperative to understand that the first words that Jesus gave uh, to Peter and to Andrew were those two words. You ready? Follow me. All right. And I will make you fishers of men. We see in verse number 20, their obedience. They straightway immediately they left their nets and followed him. So that's Peter's introduction to us in Scripture. Now, I'd like to fast forward in Peter's life, Peter's ministry with Christ pretty significantly. I'll uh, pass by his cutting uh, the ear off of Caiaphas, his servant there. I'll fast forward walking on water. I'll fast forward his boldness and his brashness. I'll I'll pass forward, uh, uh, fast forward past each of those things. But I'd like you to take your attention uh, to Luke chapter number 22 uh, this morning and look in verse number 31. <clears throat> We're going to fast forward directly to Peter's failure. And uh, that seems, it seems like often a, uh, it seems like a cruel thing to do that, uh, but we've got a limited amount of time. And uh, so we're going to look at his failure and we're going to look at how his failure wasn't final this morning. Look at verse number 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Simon's name was Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Uh, Verse number 32, but I've prayed for thee. Jesus speaking here to Peter, I've prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee, both in prison and to death. I can just see it with almost a flourish. I'm ready to go with thee, both in prison or in death. You know, just delivering that there. Fancy, fancy Peter here. And Jesus pops that balloon real quick. And he says, And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Well, that kind of took the air out of his cells, didn't it? (laughs) Lord, I'm ready to go with you both in life and in death. Hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. I'm going to deny that you even know me three times. I want you to rewind in this passage a little bit to verse number 31, because I believe it's very imperative that we address this. Jesus speaking to Simon, he says, Behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. And I want to focus on that little idea of sifting you like wheat. That is not something that that I do. It's not on my resume, a wheat sifter. I'm not... Uh, I'm not very in touch uh, with that, to be honest with you. I had to Google what it meant. Uh, I knew vaguely what it meant, but uh, didn't know very uh, detail-wise exactly what it was. And so Google will teach us this morning. 
This idea of sifting would take place during the threshing of the wheat, of the wheat rather. And after the wheat was reaped, the stalks would be placed into threshing floors that would be constructed uh, on the outskirts of the fields. And animals would take threshing equipment. They'd, uh, they'd bring it over the stalks of, of wheat. It, this also happened with corn. Uh, they would bring that equipment over in order to separate uh, the different grains, the wheats or uh, the corn uh, from the husks or the, the chaff. And then the husk and the grain would be what's called winnowed. They would throw them up in the air and they'd allow the wind to blow away the, the husk, the chaff, the extra, the, the unimportant uh, parts. The grain then would remain, but it'd be mixed with stones and lumps of soil, which uh, clung to the different roots when it was, it was reaped. And so a sifter would, would be used to separate the grain from the stones. And during that time, the grain would be placed in that sifter. It would be tossed all about up in the air to separate the grains uh, from the dirt and from the stones. And so Jesus here, as he's speaking to Peter, he's speaking in terms that he would relate to, he would understand. He said, Satan desires to have you, Peter. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I like to be wanted. I, I, I like uh, when I was in school and when we were picking teams uh, for whatever sport it was, uh, I wanted desperately to not be the last guy picked, right? I mean, I wanted to be wanted, and when they would call my name second to last, it would mean so much to me because Billy was last, and they wanted me more than Billy, right? Yeah, poor Billy. He's still recovering from that. <laughs> By the way, I didn't go to school with a guy named Billy. I just made that up. I was picked last, let's be honest. <laughs> But the idea of being wanted, I, I like the fact that my wife loves me, and I'm thankful that for some reason in this world, she wanted me. But I don't take it as much of a compliment that Satan would desire to have me. And I doubt that Peter did either. And Jesus says to Peter, Satan's desired to have you. And then he says this, that he may sift you as wheat. He's literally saying, Satan wants to toss you about and agitate you in order to cause your faith to fail. That's not something that sounds very fun, is it? It's not something that sounds like something I want to endure. So he says there in verse number one, he desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. We're going to move forward a little bit here. We're going to come back to this uh, passage in a little bit. But I just want to say this morning that Satan would love to have you. And understand the reason that he wanted to have Peter here wasn't simply because Peter was a giant. Peter, if you haven't noticed, Peter's failed quite a bit. It wasn't that he wanted him because it was a giant. It was because Peter had a heart to do something for God. And can I say that people greatly used of God are seldom times giants. Most of the time, they're just people that are smart enough to say, I've got to get out of God's way. Amen. And the people who God uses are oftentimes the most broken and the most uh, the most or the least likely candidates that you would ever, ever choose. But this morning, wherever you are, can I just tell you, Satan would love to have you. Satan would love to have your family. Satan would love to have this church. Satan would love nothing more than to sift you like wheat and to see you blow about in the wind. Satan would love it. This week, uh, Twitter rejoiced over a man. He was a Christian author that had grown up, he had written some books as a teenager, grew up, and as an adult began to pastor and began to be very influential, to be very honest. Over the last several years, he had stepped back from pastoring and gone into a secular workplace, and, and that is his decision. I, I'll not be the one to, to judge that. But last, uh, last week, he announced on Twitter that he'd be leaving his wife and uh, that also he was very uh, sorry uh, for rejecting uh, those that he had rejected through his uh, ministry. And he uh, renounced his faith in Christ. He said, I would no longer consider myself a believer. There's a man who sold literally millions of books as a Christian author. If I named the book, you would know it. Your parents probably uh, made you read it while you were dating. It's called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And he grew up and he became a pastor, a very influential pastor. And this week renounced his faith. And Twitter goes alive, and, and there are people commenting. I began to read the comments until I couldn't take any more, and I 
I quit, but it was young men and women who had grown up in Christian homes, who had grown up and renounced their faith. And they were saying things to him like, welcome to the dark side. Oh, you don't know how happy this makes me to finally see somebody who is as influential as you turning your back on God. And comment after comment after comment after comment. And I thought to myself, this is a sad day for the cause of Christ. Because here's a person that had some sort of standing and some sort of, of, of stage that is now falling. Can I say Satan would love nothing more than to do that to each and every one of you. Say, well, I'm not important. You're the father of your home. You're the mother of your home. You're a leader in your workplace. You're a leader in this church. Satan would love to have you. Let's look at Peter's failure a little more in depth here. Look down in verse number 54 of chapter number 22. Then they took him, we're speaking of Jesus here. They led him, they brought him into the high priest house. Peter followed afar off, and this is notated in uh, several of the Gospels. Luke is the narrative we choose to look at today. Peter followed afar off. When they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire, earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, denied Jesus. By the way, he didn't deny her. He denied Jesus. I don't know him. Saying, woman, I know him not. Okay. Look at verse number 58. After a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. Peter said, man, I am not. About the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he spake, the cock grew. We look at passages like this and we say, man, Peter is just a a failure. We, we listen to Jesus telling him just verses uh, before, uh, probably some period of maybe eight to ten hours prior to this, Jesus has said after Peter has said, uh, I'm going to go with you, whether it's in life or in death, I'm going to follow you, accompanied by his uh, pleasantries there. And Jesus said, before the day is over, before the cock crows three times, you are going to deny me. Even with that in the back of his mind, Peter sitting here uh, by this fire, Peter sitting here is denying Christ, denying Christ, denying Christ. We see his great failure here. You say, well, Peter is a failure. The truth is, most of us have this uh, thing inside of us called self-preservation. Yeah. And we tend to do whatever it takes to keep ourselves uh, in a good situation. Peter here is watching how they're treating Jesus. And Peter knows, man, Jesus has never done anything wrong. Man, they're having to come up with stories on Jesus. They wouldn't have to make up stories on me. (laughs) Yeah? Man, look how they're treating him, and he's perfect. They wouldn't have to make up a whole lot about me. And Peter's sitting here, and he's trying to blend in, but he's curious. And he's watching here, and, hey, you know, I know you. You've been with him. No, man, I don't know him. Uh, no, I'm, I'm positive. You've been. No, no. You're, I'm po- Man, you are a Galilean. This man, this is him. And the Bible says in other narratives of this passage that he cursed. He said, I do not know him. Blankety blank, leave me alone. I bet you that for some amount of time, the people that had watched Jesus and seen Peter along his side, they had identified Peter as a go-getter, man. Peter's a leader. Man, Peter's the first one when Jesus says, hey, here's what we're going to do. Peter's the first one jumping there. I bet you if you were watching uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ, you'd identify Peter as, man, I wouldn't mind being like that guy. I, I, hey, listen, I'm going to put him up on a pedestal. He's somebody. He's rubbing arms with Jesus. Jesus goes to him when he needs something done. I mean, if I'm looking for somebody that's successful in ministry, dude, Peter, that's the guy. Are you following me? Oftentimes in life, we tend to look at people and we tend to idolize them. Our culture is enamored with man worship to the point that we worship some really foolish individuals. But we look for people for celebrity and we look for heroes and we look for role models. But eventually we see the real person and the shine wears off, huh? 
And each man's just an ordinary man. If we're not guilty, we can do the same thing with the disciples. We see them as some sort of spiritual superstars, but at heart, they're just ordinary men, and they're men with faults. I want you to think about this. Peter, through the other Gospels, as Jesus said, you're going to deny me. Peter, Peter, as he was speaking to Jesus in this passage, Luke twenty two thirty three, I'm ready to go with thee in prison and in death. In Matthew twenty six, in this response to the same uh, the same uh, comment, there Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. In Mark fourteen, the narrative and Mark of this story, he spake the more vehemently, passionately. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. In that passage, the Bible says, likewise also said they all. They all agreed. Hey, we're all on board. Hey, yeah, what Peter said, right? What are you saying? He was so sure that he wasn't going to let God down, wasn't he? Isn't that like us? I mean, be honest. I don't think you'd be here if you didn't want to stand for Jesus. I can think of other things that you can do on a Sunday morning. I believe that if you're here, you have a heart to serve him. I believe that. And we're firm, man. We're not going to let him down. Let me tell you, let me remind you, there's another, and he is very determined to see us fail. Jesus, Peter, Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift you as weak. Listen, Satan makes you question. He prods and pushes and he frustrates He encourages us to make big claims which we can't always back up. Satan's after our soul. And this is, listen, it is a monumental battle. Listen, it's no cute little angel on one shoulder, devil with a pitchfork on the other shoulder. This ain't no cartoon. This is real. It's life and death. And Satan's after you. We tend to stand in the middle of this war and we get caught. And one moment we seem so confident. And the next moment we mess up and we fail and the wind's knocked out of ourselves and down we go. Spiritual strength zapped, uh, confidence smashed. And it happens. It happens all the time. Satan's desire is to sift. His desire is to toss us about, to threaten our comfort, to threaten our normal. And when he sifts, a lot of damage can be done. I want you to remember this in the middle of that sifting, in the middle of that difficulty, In the middle of that temptation, Jesus here speaking to Peter, but I've prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Here's the truth. Peter wasn't alone in this challenge. Uh, Peter had all the resources that he needed to to help him with this challenge. Uh, The road of denial, that was one of two options. He didn't have to, to choose that way. We sing a song like, He will hold me fast. The reason a song like that means so much is because there are moments in life that it feels pretty rough to be a Christian. And that idea that He'll hold me fast, the reason we love words like refuge and and strength, uh, the reason we love stuff like that is because we recognize, hey, in the midst of difficulty, we are not alone. What are you saying? I'm saying failure doesn't have to be your option. Failure is not final, but you don't have to fail either. Yet despite the prayers and despite the promise, despite the encouragement of Jesus, listen, Jesus praying for him, (laughs) Peter fails. I mean, this morning he's so confident, he's adamant that he's committed to the Lord. This matter of hours later, woman, I don't know him. Man, I don't know him. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And the rooster crows. How do you think he's feeling now? The Bible gives us some insight. Verse number 61 of chapter 22. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Pause a moment and just let the weight of that sink in. The Lord turned and looked on Peter. Man, I'm telling you, I don't know him. That's heavy. And here's what the Bible says, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord. 
I honestly, this is my take on it. I think scripture aligns with it, but I don't think he realized as he's, as he's denying Christ exactly what he was doing. And when he denied him that third time in that cock crew and Jesus turned and looked at him, I think he remembered, oh no. Because his intentions have been not to fail. His intentions have been, hey, listen, I'm going to do the right thing here. And in his mind, he'd probably convinced himself that staying alive was probably a good idea. And Jesus turned. And he looked at him. And isn't it so true that we can convince ourselves oftentimes that what we're doing is okay? No, it's not that bad. I mean, if I, if I weigh the ethics of this versus that, I mean, that's not really that bad. Because here's my intention with it. I've got a pure intention. I'm just, I'm trying to do the right thing. And then the Lord, right? The light of the word and the Holy Spirit it works on your heart. And when you see the holiness of God and you see your failure, it is very obvious to you that your failure is your failure. Is it not? Oh my. And so look what he does. He remembered the word of the Lord. I had said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept. And bitterly. Say, man, that's so sad. Peter failed him, and now he's off just crying. No, no, no. What bitterly? Let's look at the let's look at the Greek for that. Let's understand what it means. That word weep there, it means to sob loudly. When it says bitterly there, it means to well aloud violently. Let me just let me just paint this picture for you. We are talking a grown man. A, by the way, a strong man. We are talking about a man with some oomph to him. We're talking about a man, listen, surrounded by soldiers, and he whips out a sword. Let's go to war, buddy. I'm, we're not talking about some wimpy little uh, man. We're talking about, I mean, he's a man. And Jesus turned and looked at him. He goes out and weeps bitterly. Can I tell you, this is where that shame enters in. Because I think as Peter walked out of that place, and he went and fell apart, Satan's doing a happy dance. Ha <laughs> ha, got him. Oh, Peter, 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 walked on water but couldn't talk to a maid. Ah, <laughs> Peter, Peter. Oh, remember that time that Peter was, oh, but look at him now. Woo, ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, now that's silly and it's funny, but I want you to understand, hey, I'm rejoicing because I've taken one of the primary tools at Christ's disposal. I've taken a partner in ministry. I have taken somebody that did some big things for Jesus, and I just got a little maid to get him to turn his back. Oh, I'm rejoicing. I am happy because I am breaking apart uh, what God does, and Satan loves breaking apart what God does. Satan loves laying ruin to what God does. Satan loves to cause doubt about what God does. Satan loves to deceive. Don't you think for a moment that your failure does not make Satan rejoice. See, people, here's what, here's what the problem is. Oftentimes, we get in a, we get in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. I guess it's, it's deep. And we think to ourselves, oh, it's just me. It's just me. Nobody even knows about this. We fail and we mess up and it affects us in ways we don't see. And years later, we see ramifications for that failure because sin always, listen, sin always has consequence. And that consequence, the principle of reformers unanimous is this, that consequences are inevitable, they're incalculable, they're up to God. Hey, sin always has a consequence and it's a big consequence. And Satan, ha <laughs> ha. Peter ain't doing nothing right now. Jesus is dying. <laughs> Peter's crying. I've won. You hear me? The shame sets in. And Peter, as he's weeping bitterly, Satan's just exploiting, exploiting. And that's the difference between making a mistake and feeling we are a mistake. Because Peter in this moment is not feeling, I just made a mistake. 
He is a mistake. He just told me, Peter, what are you doing? Peter, he just said you were going to do this. Peter! Yeah, truth is, that's, that's who you are, Peter. You're a failure. That's what you do, Peter. You fail. Just change your name to failure, because that's, that's what you do, Peter. Remember that time he called you out in the water? You were so proud of yourself. Everybody's watching you walk on the water. <laughs> Winds and waves, you sunk. I bet you John could have walked longer on that water. You hear me? I bet you John could have walked longer on that water. You say, that didn't happen. That's not in the Bible. You, do you see in the Bible all the times the disciples compared themselves against one another, one another? By the way, that's a message coming up next. That's either tonight or next Sunday morning. We're going to talk about comparison. But they were always comparing themselves to one another. Satan, Satan, say, hey, hey, I bet you John could have walked longer on that water. I bet you, I bet you Thomas, Thomas is a doubter. And Thomas could have sat there and listened to that maiden not said anything. But Peter, you're a failure. He doesn't work that way. He works that way in my life. That shame can lead to a variety of emotions and actions. I'm not just unqualified. I'm disqualified. I'm done. I'm finished. Man, Jesus Jesus said I was going to fail him, and I did it. And he violently shook as he realized the significance of his failure. Peter's denied him three times. And he turns and looks at him. Here's how I think Peter interpreted that face. I think at first it was a, I told you so face. And I think the more he wept and cried bitterly, the more shame he felt, the more he felt, oh, it was a disappointed face. He's disappointed in me. And the more that he cried and he wept, it was, you're, you're a failure, Peter. And Satan saying, remember when he looked at you, here's what he didn't say, but here's what he thought. Here's what Jesus thought about you, Peter. Are you following me? But can I tell you what that face was? I believe it with all my heart. I believe that turned face was that I have prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail face. I believe that was a, you may have just failed me, but Peter, I'm never going to fail you. You say, what are you talking about? Go back to that prayer. Go back to verse 32 of chapter 22. I, I don't know about you. I've never heard this preached on. I've never seen this before. This did wonders in my heart this morning. Verse number 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Oh, that's cute. No, no, look. And when thou art converted... Strengthen thy brethren. Here's that word converted. It doesn't mean he gets saved. Here's what it means. He says when you're returned. What, what are you saying? Christ knew Peter would fail. And he didn't just know it. He told him. And he said, when you've returned, listen, after you've failed, I'm praying that you'll strengthen your brethren. Listen, listen. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. Well, his faith failed. He denied Christ. Jesus' prayer request wasn't answered. No, 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 no. Long term, long term, long term. Because we're seeing the instance and God is seeing, are you ready for this? We're seeing the instance, but God is seeing three decades of service after his failure. What are you saying? Failure is not final. Jesus' prayer request here for Peter wasn't specifically for this moment because in this moment he knew he'd fail. It was for years of service afterwards. You say, well, what happens after this story? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you John 21. Go to John 21 in your Bible. We're going to cover a lot of scripture here in just a quick amount of time. This is good. 
There's seven disciples out fishing. They've caught nothing all night. There's a man on the shore that says, hey, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. These guys are fishermen. That's insulting. But they do it, and there's a miraculous catch. Peter realizes, oh, my goodness, that's Jesus. He can't wait to get him. He jumps into the water and swims to shore. He's so anxious uh, to see Jesus even after his failure. Why? Because he remembers that glance, and by now the Lord has confirmed in his heart that is not a look of disapproval. That is not a look of disappointment. That is not not a look of failure. That is a look of, I will never fail you. I love you, Peter. I love you, Peter. John 21, verse 15. So when they dined, this is, oh, this is so good. Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter's been waiting for a moment like this where he could reaffirm to Christ how much he loved him. Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. And so he saith unto him again a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him a third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. By the way, let's just pause a moment. Let's let that sink in. You think that was really real to him in this moment? Jesus knows all things. By the way, the last time something happened in threes, it wasn't too good for Peter, was it? Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. And then in verse number 18 and 19, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. Pause. Peter, lovest thou me? Lord, you know I love you. Well, here's what's going to happen. When you get old, your arms are going to be stretched out. Peter died of being crucified upside down. He signifies to him, hey, Peter, you're going to... You're going to serve me. It's going to cost you everything. Hey, Peter, I love you. Serving me, though, it's going to cost you everything. Look at the end of that verse. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, next two words. <laughs> I don't know if you're picking up what I'm putting down. But at the beginning of this message, when he met Peter, what did he say? Now when he's about to leave him, what's he say? Nostalgia rushes over Peter. I remember when he called me. We've been through a lot together. But he still loves me the same way he did when he met me. And he's still got as much plan for me and purpose for me, as he did when he met me. Follow me. He still wants me. Are you seeing this like I'm seeing it? I could, uh, I could, uh, there's so many different things that we could say here, but folks, the Lord knows your frailties, and he knows your failures, and he still loves you. He knew Peter would deny him. And he still loved him. He knew he had failed him. And he still, listen, he faced false accusations. He took the beating. He endured the humiliation. He let himself be condemned by 
Roman courts. He carried his cross to the death. He endured the, the spikes being driven. He surrendered to the wrath of God, anger being poured out upon him, the only one that didn't deserve it. Jesus did all of that, and he knew exactly what we were like. Why? Because he's got a bigger plan in mind. Would you take your Bibles to Acts chapter number 1? We're going to look at just a few passages in Acts really quickly here because this is important. Uh, I think it was Paul Harvey that used to say, and that's the rest of the story, right? Here's the rest of the story. Acts 1. Look at verse number 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He's got a bunch of questions here. He said unto them, It's not for you to know the times of the season which the Lord hath, or the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all, all Judea and Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they steadfastly, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? By the way, I just want to paint this picture for you. He's here, he's talking to us, he gone. Did y'all see that? Hey, uh, Thomas, you're the doubter. You saw that though, right? Hey, uh, hey Peter, that, that just happened, right? Yeah, John, I think it did. And then these two guys, hey, what are y'all looking up there for? <laughs> you listen? Because they're gazing steadfastly up to heaven. Hey, uh, hey, guys, what are y'all looking up there for? Hey, guys, attention, focus. He's gone now. We got a job to do. You listen? We got a job to do. Look at verse number uh, 11. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Hey, hey, guys, he's coming back. There's a job to do. Let's get busy. Yeah, verse number 12. Then they returned, then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they were come in, they went into an upper room. Here's who was there. There are both Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, Judas, the brother of James. And they, uh, then these all gathered uh, with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. Look at verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. We're not going to go into everything he says here, but here's what happens. Peter steps up. Go to chapter number 2 of Acts chapter, or Acts, uh, chapter number 2, verse number 14. They're speaking here in Acts to an audience that was not exactly receptive to their message. And as they're here in Acts chapter number 2, uh, this is actually, I'm sorry, this is a receptive audience. This is Pentecost. He's standing here in Acts chapter number 2, verse number 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. He goes on to give the gospel. There's a lot, a lot of reception. Look in verse 37. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They said unto Peter and the rest of the disciples, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said, I'm glad you ask. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his words were baptized in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, I'm glad Peter was used. I'm glad Peter was able to overcome his failure. I'm glad God did something with him. That's a nice story. Put a bow on it. He's not done. Turn to chapter number 4. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They're upset. Hey, Something's happening here. Hey, by the way, 5,000 people saved and baptized throughout Jerusalem. I don't think they did that in one location. I think they probably had watering stations all over Jerusalem, people getting dunked. Hey, buddy, you notice something happening here. What's going on? It's a resurgence. Hey, what's going on? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a making alive. What's going on? There's something changing here. What's going on? Hey, Jesus. Hey, get those guys in here. We need to talk to them. And they laid hands on them, put them in hold to the next day. 
Hey, let's lock them up. Let's, we got to squash this. We got to stop this. This is, this is our well-being. This is everything we're teaching. They're undermining everything that we've built. How be it? Many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, as many were of the kindred of the high priest, they were gathered together at Jerusalem. When they set them in the midst, they said, By what power, by, by what name have you done this? Verse number 8, who? Then Peter, <laughs> filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? By the way, that's a story right there. Verse number 10, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, that little dig right there, whom God raised from the dead. And there's another one. Even by him doth this, doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, neither is there salvation in any, any other, for there is none under the name under heaven given among men, whereby me must be saved. Now, I muttered all the way through that verse, but you got the picture. Hey, guys, ain't nobody going to heaven except by Jesus, the one you crucified, and he rose again. Woo! Verse 13. <laughs> When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. Skip down to verse number 18. They called them and commanded them not to speak or at all, not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But, Je but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. <laughs> That's Peter. Peter is an ordinary man who had a catastrophic failure, who now stands and says, I can't be quiet. Why, Peter? Peter? Because I've allowed the thoughts and actions and reactions of others to rule my commitments to God way too long. And I don't care if you accept me or not, because the glory of God is my only focus. Acts chapter 4, he's standing before Annas and Caiaphas, the two men ultimately responsible for having Jesus condemned by the Jewish courts. Is he afraid? Uh-uh. <laughs> is he silent? Nope. Does he deny Christ? Hey, listen to me. Listen to me. You'll not see him deny Christ until he dies and he doesn't deny him then. Faced with an upside down cross. Never. Never. Instead, we see him condemning those who rejected Jesus. And from this point, Peter will go on and serve Christ for three more decades before he's put to death. What are you saying? You ready? Failure ain't final. By the way, your failure, your failure didn't take Christ by surprise. This is a good thought. This will help you. Listen to me. Your failure doesn't take God by surprise. You say, what do you mean? He paid for it already. No, omniscient. He knows exactly the failure that you feel like you are. He knows exactly the mistakes you've made. He knows exactly the willful violations of Scripture. He knows exactly all the times that your wandering heart has strayed from Him. He, he knows exactly who you are. He knows better than you know who you are. And He loves you. And He gave Himself for you. And He has a plan for you. And He has a purpose for you. And your failure, your failure, your failure has been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Quit living in shame. Jonathan, that's a cute thought, but you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. I know what he paid for. Oh, yeah. So many of you are sidelined by shame. Get off the sideline, do something for Jesus. He paid for that sin. It's done. And the one who's shaming you is Satan. Put him in his place. Hey, uh, hey, Satan. I know you keep bringing this up, 
but I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. Hey, you can quit dancing. I messed up. It's over. It's paid for. Jesus paid for that at Calvary. What are you dancing about, son? You, you hear me? Hey, your shame, that's a tool of Satan. It's a dangerous emotion that sidelines too many people. Your failure's not final. Listen, get yourself right before God. Psalm 51, you'd do well to read that and apply it to your life. Get it right before God. He's already paid for it. Psalm 51 is just making right. Psalm 51, let's restore this relationship. Psalm 51, hey, give me the joy of my salvation back, please. Hey, my salvation's already there, but can I have my joy back? Yeah. And remind that wicked one that he lost. It's over. You say, he'll come at me. He's already coming at you. And he'll do it until the day that he's cast. And that'll be a day. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for Peter. We thank you for not allowing his failure to define him, but instead allowing us to learn from his failure. And might we all learn from our failures and the failures of others. God, I pray, I pray, I pray, God, that you'd use us for your glory. We have a limited amount of days on this earth. We have a limited amount of breath in this lung, these lungs. And, Father, I pray that you'd help us to use every day that we have to serve you, to glorify you. Father, I pray that we'd not slip into temptation, that we'd not step into uh, lust, that we'd not pursue the things that make us uh, feel God, but, Father, that we glorify you, that we'd be dead to sin, that we'd be alive in Christ. I pray that we'd be holy and blameless. I pray that we would live like the royal priesthood that we've been called to live But God, I pray that you'd get glory through our lives. And I pray that this morning you would wake up, that you'd stir up, that you'd shake up the Christian in here that's been wallowing around in shame and self-pity. And would we remind the evil one that he has lost? The victory has been won. We have been bought and paid for for the one here that doesn't know you as Savior. And Satan tells them how big of a failure they are. Would you help them to understand that that failure has been paid for? that the only thing they need to do is come to Christ by faith, placing their faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, and accepting the gift of life that he offers. Pray if there's, not one, if there's one here that doesn't know you, that today would be that day that they place their faith in you. For the one who's sidelined by shame, help them get off the sidelines this morning, do something for the Lord. Pray that we'd not allow our failures to define us. Pray that we'd learn from them, not repeat them. Take the example of Peter and do something big for you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to your feet if you would. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today, you you don't know that heaven's your home. You don't have a relationship with Christ. Can I ask you? Can I ask you to think about that? I'm gonna ask you really quickly a question. I'd just like to pray for you if I could. If you say, Jonathan, if I died today, I don't know that heaven would be my home. I'm aware of that. I'm not sure of where I'd spend eternity. That concerns me. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up there where you are? Nobody's looking. I'm not calling you out or embarrassing you. But Jonathan, if I die today, I don't know heaven be my home. Slip your hand up. If you say, Jonathan, if I die today, I do know heaven would be my home. My sin's been paid for. Jesus died, forgave me of my sins, and I accepted by faith through him uh, what he's done for me on Calvary. I've taken that gift of eternal life. I know if I died that heaven would be my home. If you say, Jonathan, I'm a child of the king this morning, would you slip your hand up? Now look at me, look at me, look at me. Live like it. Live like it. Man, he fought the greatest battle that's ever been fought, and it was no contest. He smoked him. Jesus paid for the sin of the whole world. You wallowing around in your sin and your shame, the only one that wins there, the only one that wins there is Satan. Why? Because he keeps people from coming to Christ. Because if he can sideline you with shame, then you ain't going to tell your neighbor about the one who saved you. Yeah. Here's what we're going to do. The pianists are going to play. I'd encourage you to step out from your seat, spend some time at the altar, pray there where you are, but say, hey, Lord, help me. Give me strength. Give me boldness. I thank you for paying for my failure, and I ask you that you help me to move on from it. God, would you accomplish something big through my life? Wherever you are, you do business with the Lord. We're just going to play for a little bit here.